Welcome everybody, I'm Roly Keating, uh, Chief Exec of the British Library. Welcome to the Knowledge Centre uh, here at the BL for this uh, session uh, of In Conversation with myself and uh, Mariana, more in a moment. Uh, this building hosts talks, events of many, many kinds, uh, but we are especially delighted to be collaborating um, with Mariana's new institution, the Institution for Innovation and Public Purpose, which is based literally just up the road at the Bartlett School at uh, UCL, our, our Knowledge Quarter partners. Uh, innovation and Public Purpose are two phrases, two concepts which are very close to our heart here at the British Library, which is why I was uh, very pleased to join your advisory council um, when you got the whole thing going really quite recently. This is a very young institution, it's just getting going. And this sequence of talks, tonight is the first, um, is our, called Rethinking Public Value and Public Purpose uh, in 21st Century Capitalism. So it's not an unambitious uh, topic, but luckily there are no less, no fewer than eleven talks uh, to explore it uh, from all, from many, many different angles, from voices across arts, architecture, design, and of course Mariana's discipline uh, of economics, ranging from Brian Eno, Stephanie Kelton, Richard Rogers, Amanda Levite, uh, and many, many more. So if you haven't picked up the program, please make sure you schedule them into your uh, diary. Um, but my uh, interlocutor tonight, as well as being the mastermind of all of this, uh, needs very little introduction. Uh, it says here, I think it describes as the world's scariest e <laughs> economist. I, I've never personally found myself scared by Mariana, <laughs> but I've undoubtedly noticed that she is uh, the most original, independent-minded, and perhaps daring economist uh, of her generation, uh, daring to challenge, question, uh, some of the sacred cows or assumptions, not just of powerful industrial or financial sectors, but also of her own uh, discipline, and I'm sure we'll be exploring that uh, in the course of the evening. Uh, uh, there is a new book under her name shortly to come out, in fact, in bookshops uh, tomorrow, uh, called The Value of Everything, uh, and once you've all had time to read it over the next few weeks, uh, Mariana, you'll be back here uh, for an event as part of this sequence on the 9th of July. Uh, tonight, we are going to be in conversation with each other and with you, we very much hope, uh, swapping experiences uh, around, broadly around this theme of public value as a term. Uh, myself, I guess, talking from some of my professional experience here, uh, running a public institution also at the BBC, uh, and Mariana from the theoretical work that she's been doing. Uh, so there'll be a moment, uh, at least sort of two thirds of the way through, when everybody will have a chance to put up a hand. And so if you hear things you disagree with or want to engage with, please do engage. But Mariana, do you want to set the scene? Yes, sure. Tonight? So first of all, we are thrilled in the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose in UCL to be collaborating on this series. Um, having it at the British Library, which is such an important public institution, which is especially, I think, also interested recently in civic engagement and getting the wider uh, London and actually UK community involved mm. in thinking about what it means to have a public space, public digital, public books. What does it mean to engage with communities who are also actually undergoing difficult times in a period in which we perhaps are undermining certain parts of the public. Uh, for us it's very important because the word public purpose, at least in economics, it's not really there. <laughs> and believe it or not, even the word public value is not really there. It's in philosophy. You know, from Aristotle onwards, there was lots of discussions about what do we mean by social value and public value. And in economics, we do have concepts like the public good. And it sounds good, because it's called the public good. But actually, I believe it's become too narrow. And this is why we actually set up the Institute, which was to engage with the wide community of stakeholders about actually thinking about how do you create a better economy, a better society, by actually rethinking these concepts. And what this seminar series is trying to do, this lecture series at the British Library, is to engage artists, uh, city planners, economists. We even have the chief economist for Bernie Sanders coming to give a talk on public budgets to really rethink this issue of purpose, because purpose is about directionality. It's not about leveling the playing field. It's perhaps about tilting it so we get a certain type of society, a certain type of economy. And so we are thrilled to be having this lecture series. And tonight, as Rolly said, is the first one. And we are going to be quite general on purpose, because it sort of 
in some ways seen as a menu of what's to come. Mm. And um, so that's it. That's really the introduction to the series. And you are the first to come to what we hope to be a really interesting uh, you know, next three or four months in this space. So why don't we begin the conversation? First of all, I am so happy that you know to have uh, Roly as the first person to really engage and tease out some of the difficulties because we shouldn't be too comfortable. By the way, if we make you too comfortable, we're not doing our job. <laughs> this is a difficult area. It's an area that we should, I think, be contesting, and we won't all have the same opinion. Um, and as someone who had a very senior position both in the BBC and now, of course, as a chief executive of the British Library, which both of these institutions, both the BBC and the British Library, have particular remits. They have particular organizations that require particular types of people, perhaps, to come in and do interesting things. But they also have to evaluate what they do. Uh, they have public budgets, which every year or every two years have to be rethought. These are some of the issues that we want to talk about. What is the relationship between how you evaluate a public entity, how it nurtures the kind of capacity building inside, and even how it just positions its mission statement. So this is where I want to begin, okay. which is if you could kind of tease out for us, especially I would like to actually begin with the BBC Ooh, experience, sure. which we know has a charter review, which engages the BBC people to think about what it was meant to do, did it do it, how this concept of public purpose, how did you talk about that? And was there difficulty in talking about it, given the kind of words that are being used in terms of public responsibilities, duties, are you fixing the public good or not? If you could just tell us the story about. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best. Yeah. Let, let's, uh, let's go back a little bit. I guess the, um, uh, uh, the particular reason I got engaged with this is when I was at the BBC, I've been at the library about five or six years now, but. When I was at the BBC in the early 2000s, of 2003, 4, as you rightly say, Marianne, the BBC is an interesting public entity because it has a charter which needs to be renewed every decade or so, uh, which is pretty exhausting when you work there, but it's actually pretty healthy as well because it means it's, you have to have a debate, which is a slightly existential debate, every decade. Uh, and if you do it well, that kind of keeps everybody um, honest. Uh, but it does mean you have to go right back to first principles. And we were, we were, therefore, I was part of a small team charged with trying to think our way into this uh, at that stage. This is like, by the way, revisiting kind of an, an, a back catalogue album or something. The BBC has a whole new charter since then. So this is the last charter uh, but one. And the argument has probably moved on a little bit. But it was, it was an interesting hmm. and important moment. And... Uh, we were probably as now, but particularly then, I guess, confronted with a, a policy landscape, an intellectual landscape. Uh, maybe some of the team at Ofcom, but actually, to be honest, mu much more, more widely, uh, which would look at broadcasting really as a functioning market. Uh, and maybe there are failures. And the starting position was all the BBC should be doing uh, is remediating things at the edge of the market, as it were, th things that, were, that might otherwise not happen. And uh, I can only say I am not an economist. Here's my declaration of, uh, of interest. I'm categorically not that. I was a program maker, a, a manager, leader, creative leader. Uh, that, that theory of the world, uh, as well as being obviously potentially encroaching and diminishing for a, for a great institution, just didn't chime emotionally, I think, with what we, people who work at the BBC, people who used and loved the BBC, seemed to feel it was for. Uh, I think when we got out of bed in the morning, we felt we were building value. We were, we were creating something. Uh, and it wasn't, I'm sure there are limits to it, but it wasn't as it were, it was simply waiting until you could get to the edge of something else. It was distinctive, and it was a very particular kind of, of value and creativity and education and so on that we were hoping to, to bring to the nation and the world. But we were really conscious we couldn't find a theory to help us uh, express that. Uh, and every time, uh, much as we love economists, we started to debate this with economists, you found yourself being kind of trapped into narrower and, uh, and narrower corners. And I, we can explore mm -hmm. this and how we, uh, I guess there were maybe two strands to, to the work we did back then. One was about uh, purpose, wherever the word purpose mm -hmm. is. Uh, 
And that, it may be an, a little known, lesser used word in e economics, it is there in the BBC. We knew we, we had a purpose, uh, but we did a bit of review about the language that we'd used over the previous 50 years. And it was wild diversity of language from uh, uh, Inform, Educate and Entertain, which was the sort of 1920s John Reith, very simple formula, up to very, very contorted and over-elaborate uh, language, none of which really resonated. Uh, but we did some work to try and clarify uh, a language of purpose, and we've done something similar here. But in terms of how you might actually engage with our, with policy makers, win hearts and minds, talk to Treasury, we, to be honest, stuck our necks out and tried to, to, to think a bit differently. And we seized on this term, public value, which is why it's so interesting that, that, that you've now, a decade or so later, um, uh, begun to really uh, enrich it. Uh, uh, we, I, I will admit, I was working with um, my colleagues Charles Constable, Daniel Nagler, and various others. Uh, and I think it was um, Danielle who was doing research at the time with the Number 10 Policy Unit. Uh, and they were beginning to use that term, I think, in connection with the health service, right. quite loosely. And uh, we began to, in very broad terms, test it on our own activity and co opt it and think, well, Surely, if we believe we are building value, and we're not building commercial value, we have no shareholders, uh, so you can't directly say we're a wealth-creating entity. What are we creating? What are we making it? And, uh, uh, and we began to think we are making... We, looked, we began to look at that with our purpose. Is there a kind of value in um, supporting citizenship and public discourse, in, in, in promoting education beyond the traditional education system, in, in giving voice to British creativity and culture and connected, and so on. And uh, I guess to cut a long story short, we saw a framework of public purposes which were very loosely, we would position as dimensions of public value mm. which require investment. And undoubtedly, if you over-invest in certain ways, certain yeah. kinds of creative entertainment, whatever, then maybe you do start intruding on a market or do, you know, doing things which a market could do. That's where it gets many yeah. places, many other places we might want to talk about where it gets. I'm not saying it's easy, it's, but it's interestingly difficult. So can I but the underlying theory was that, that all ships could rise, that if you got it right, right if you made the right investment, you grow public mm. value and grow um, commercial and economic value as well. So that's really interesting because the word investment, let me make sure I turn to you guys as well, uh, makes one think of a portfolio of all sorts of different areas you might be investing in and I would say daring to tread. And what I meant initially when I said that the word public good has unfortunately become narrow, it didn't have to be narrow, we've made it become narrow, is that in fact it's sort of taken away this idea of investment and the portfolio because in economics, and I should apologize, yes, I'm going to be at least uh, talking about the sort of narrow economist view. Um, and we shouldn't forget John Maynard Keynes' great quote where he said, you know, practitioners on the ground, including someone like Rowley, might think they're just doing good stuff, but they're actually all slaves of defunct economic theory. <laughs> so I'm here to reveal the defunct economic theory that potentially, not for Rowley, of course, but perhaps for the Treasury, was um, constraining one's thought. Um, the kind of defunct economic theory that for us in the Institute we're trying to debunk is this issue, which I think you were actually going into uh, very interestingly, that at best you're fixing a problem in terms of what the public sector is doing out there in capitalism, right? So you have markets, you could have uh, you know, the broadcasting market, you could have a digital market, you could have an emerging green economy, and it's sort of there, and the public sector comes in to fix some sort of problem, whether there's not enough investment in a certain area because of a public good characteristic where the um, attributes of public goods like basic research are really hard to appropriate for private firms so they don't invest enough in that because they can't actually just hold the profits to themselves or in the area of pollution you might have something called negative externalities uh, so that businesses aren't actually incurring and accounting for the cost so you need something like a carbon tax to come in so this idea that you're fixing a market um, and in that case, you might be providing the public good part of the market because the private sector is not providing it. So you're filling a gap, right, is what we're trying to contest. Because in fact, listening to you talk, what you're saying is that the BBC saw itself as actually actively shaping and co-creating markets. 
And that requires a different framework, a different type of analysis, a different type of thinking of what kind of organization you need. And what I have often um, found striking about the BBC when I did look at how the Charter Review recently was um, being enacted was that there was, in fact, this very static idea that, okay, the BBC is fine. It's fixing some public good, so it's fine to do documentaries about you know, giraffes in Africa or some other kind of documentary. It's fine to do uh, high-quality news, but hey, you know, watch your space. Don't crowd out business, crowding out in areas like soap operas, talk shows, and there was this thing about fuzzy children's programs. And actually, what you're talking about is that independent of the format, literally independent of what you're doing, there might be this cross-cutting um, concept of public value that you're trying to reach and create in different types of spaces and in that process create a new type of market. And that perhaps if you're doing it in a really ambitious way, you could also later kind of crowd in, right? Bring, bring in business to also help interact with you because this should never be about public or private. So I kind of want to pause there and just ask you, a, to comment on this, because perhaps you know, I've, you know, one reads what one wants to read, but is it true? Like, would you also characterize that there has been this process of a semi-static concept of what the BBC was doing and hence almost fearing it when it was being too ambitious, this idea that you shouldn't be doing soap operas, but it's fine to do something else? And if that's true, how would you describe this kind of more cross-cutting concept of public value that even in a soap opera, perhaps you can even reflect on talk shows and soap <laughs> operas, which in theory one might think are just for the commercial sector. Um, and yet the soap operas that Berlusconi makes in my country, Italy, are obviously very different, <laughs> I won't say anything more, than the kind of BBC types of soap operas. If, if you can just reflect on that issue and then I'll, I'd like to I'll bring you back to the crowding in. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll have a go. I think on the, um, uh, the co-creation with business, with the market, I think you, you cannot not feel that at, at, at the BBC. It was a pure monopoly, by the way, for yes. you know, many decades, and that's, that, that was a fact. But gradually and then rather effectively, probably you might say looking back over 50 or 60 or 70 years, uh, markets have grown up, that are now way, way bigger than the BBC, of course, around it. And even within the BBC itself, um, you now get the dynamism of independent creative production uh, but directed, to your point about purpose, mm -hmm. for public value mm -hmm. ends. When it's being broadcast on the BBC, when it's on iPlayer, it's part of a, of a public service. And there's something about the courage to believe in the integrity of that total service, right. which does often get missed, uh, and sometimes in debates, which, by the way, are not, un, are not totally disinterested arguments. We're trying to break institutions up and, and split them down and there even in that last charter review there will be debates about looking at a, say a, a, a television show which are the public service bits and which are, <laughs> which are the other bits yeah. uh, and uh, I remember it was most eloquently put of course uh, by by my great great predecessor at, at BBC2 who is in fact coming to talk at the library tomorrow night David Attenborough yeah. um, speaking not as a maker of natural history programs, but in his, in his former role as a channel controller, where he said, well, I felt you're making a public service channel. Right. It's, a, it's a complete rich offer designed to engage as many audiences as possible or, di or different moods of the same audiences to hand people from one kind of experience to another, to bring often separated communities together wherever you can in communal experiences and if you're making a great broadcast channel, you would have all the flavours of great broadcast entertainment in there. But if you do a channel that is just soap operas, mm -hmm. then you're clearly not maximising public value. Right. You're not. You're just doing something very thin and slender. But if you exclude that wonderful, creative kind of... And I haven't seen all the Berlusconi ones, so I'm good. <laughs> I'm not saying every soap opera does this, but, but the, seriously, the very thoughtful ones. Mm -hmm. Uh, that do get made not just by the BBC in, in this country, uh, then you're actually creating, as we would recognise with all sorts of public service, a transport service, a health service, an integrated service, and many checks and balances about how you defend it and talk about it, but you can't atomise it and say there are certain things which are just for the market and certain, certain kinds of show. Uh, that are just for um, public service broadcasting. And we know there are markets, by the way, where that has happened, and, and America is probably one of them in, right. in television. 
And in terms of the specific critique of crowding out, um, did you kind of just ignore it and say, fine, let them no. talk that way and we'll, or, or how did you engage with it? Because I've found, or we have found in our different research areas within the Institute, that there's almost this copy and paste uh, critique, whether we're working with public banks, and, and we have different projects looking at the Chinese Development Bank, the German Development Bank, often these banks that are actually providing the kind of finance that private banks are not providing, because this is long-term patient strategic finance, kind of 10 to 15 to 20 year cycles versus the one to maximum three year cycles, or um, entities like the BBC, but in different spaces, it might be around city uh, strategic um, planning, or um, innovation agencies like you know, DARPA or ARPA-E in the US that this idea that you know, restrain what you're trying to do within this limited area because otherwise you might take up too much space, space that the private sector actually should be taking. And the word that's used is crowding out. You're just kind of taking up too much space. You're crowding out private initiative. And what did you actually do to combat that concept? Did you engage with it? Did you think of sure. different words? So the opposite of crowding out is crowding in. <laughs> but it still sounds negative, right? Crowding in? <laughs> like, that's positive? You're still crowding someone, which is in, instead of out. Did you rethink some of the vocabulary to describe what you were doing? It's interesting. I mean, I think that, that uh, uh, in some dimensions, you're getting to the proper, the proper debate here. And I mean, I'm, I, I would say it is perfectly, it is possible to imagine should the public exchequer ever be capable of investing in such a way, interventions which might, as it were, kill off markets at the very mm -hmm. beginning if you, do it, if you do it in the wrong way. So whether you play with vocabulary or not, uh, I think there is an ideal situation for interventions or, or public services like this where you're constantly, and we were at the time, constantly trying to think, what. What is, the, what is the, the commercial energy around us? Mm. What is the potential here? And how do you harness that? And how do you create public services which, which have always an eye to spin new things off and make new things right. happen? So it's not, it's not a brutally hard edge. Yeah. And luckily, as I say, the, for instance, the, the independent revo production revolution in the UK, which is ongoing, and the BBC, as you mm -hmm. probably know, has still taken further steps to, to begin to bring more independent production in radio and so on. Again, trade-offs there. You lose something culturally in the institution, but maybe you do enfranchise uh, mm -hmm. other kinds of, of creativity. So we addressed it. We talked about it. We analysed. Uh, we looked at the data. Uh, we looked at the absolute scale of the BBC in mm. the global. It was already then <laughs> a very, very global content distribution market using the internet even then back in 2005. And I think we fairly persuasively made the case among other cases, that um, there is indeed a crowd out there and the BBC is not the crowd. You know, right. The BBC <laughs> is you know, large, maybe on a European public yeah. broadcasting scale, but if we wish there to be a, a strong and healthy uh, broadcasting brand in the UK, then uh, making it radically smaller would probably not be a, be a great move. Hmm. Um, but there's lots of nuances to that, I think, uh, uh, in the early 2000s, there was much debate about, about the internet uh, and whether a BBC intervention onto the web was crowding out. I can only say 15 <laughs> years on, it doesn't quite feel like right. that. Uh, mm -hmm. It feels like, uh, uh, if anything, uh, the BBC is, is having to fight very, very hard to maintain its share of voice right. uh, in a medium which is, of course, open, unregulated, no, no public broadcasting. Yeah. privileges yeah. so uh, so and one of the I think really exciting issues nowadays when we think of the big challenges that we have ahead whether they be the ones around health issues or climate change is this issue of how do you actually set up collaborations between different types of institutions public private third sector as well as ones in civil society to partner to tackle these challenges and I wanted to sort of tease some of those issues out so there will be different types of partnerships you will have engaged in both with other types of public institutions and of course with private ones and if you can give us a sense of some of the interesting collaborations because sometimes the word partnerships just makes it sound like it's going to be good just because it's called a partnership but just as we know that marriages are also partnerships which sometimes end in divorce um, you know not all partnerships are great and so what are the characteristics of good partnerships and just one example that I want to um, maybe have you start off with is the partnerships with other parts of government actually so procurement policy is something that's very interesting which is often not really engaged with you know 
organizations like the BBC, but actually one of the first stories I heard that really got me interested in thinking more about what the BBC has been in the past is that when there was this learning program in the 1980s, which really had the ambition, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to get every kid to code, that resulted in two very interesting things. One, the BBC, this was a, a, a mission of the BBC, the learning program, to actually uh, fund and invest in something that later became the BBC microcomputer. Um, and in order to actually um, uh, produce it at cost efficient, um, with cost, you know, well, anyway, at cost, they also wanted to engage different private uh, uh, um, suppliers. And it was through procurement policy that they um, uh, engaged with what later became uh, proper ARM computing, which was probably one of the most innovative and interesting high-tech companies in the UK, which has recently, by the way, just been sold off to SoftBank in Japan. Whole other set of issues that we might engage with in um, another talk. But that issue of how, you know, on the one hand, there was that ambition, there was a real mission um, in the BBC, the learning program, two, to actually produce stuff, <laughs> you know, a computer being produced inside a, with, you know, with public criteria, that procurement process that actually then as a spillover allowed a really interesting company that maybe would have just remained a startup <laughs> to actually scale up and become what it later became. That is one part of the collaboration issue. You know, does the BBC still today actually engage in this dynamic way with procurement policy? But also, if you could say something then about this issue of collaborating with private institutions. Um, hmm. In that kind of, you know, I mean, Institute for Innovation, yeah, innovation yeah, in terms yeah. of structural change and... Well, we haven't touched... I, I was thinking, actually, we, we, we haven't foregrounded um, innovation yeah. that much yet. Uh, and, and, and this is, again, sitting within organizations like this, institutions like this, uh, the idea that innovation is somehow just the prerogative of one half of the economy or one part of the economy. Uh, innovation happens where people innovate, you know, yeah. and, uh, and you, you can breed very, very fertile grounds for it uh, here, BBC, elsewhere, and in dynamic uh, companies and institutions large and small. Uh, <coughs> BBC Micro was, I think, a, a rare and very powerful instance of, of, of innovation in the education sector. The BBC's got a great, great track record of program innovation and uh, technological innovation. Uh, sometimes it's, it has struggled harder in education, perhaps precisely actually because of the crowding out debates. And there are, there are other um, BBC initiatives that did bump into crowding out debates in, in the education sector. Uh, but the micro, uh, for those of you who may have had a micro or grown up mm -hmm. with it or, or, uh, or, or used it, is credited not just with some of the economic success but actually with, with um, uh, uh, one of the reasons the United Kingdom has a pretty strong gaming industry right. is a lot of kids who were 11 or 12 back in the 80s uh, had a BBC micro that was promoted on air, it did indeed introduce them to that kind of hands-on uh, creativity. Sadly, it wasn't ever followed up. Uh, I think mean, no doubt I wasn't involved in that. It was, but uh, no doubt many rules mm -hmm. and regulations, procurement yeah. rules, or whatever, it put in the too complicated box to take it much further. Until quite recently, when the BBC has been uh, been revisiting it. But that's I would say is exactly an example of trying to carefully, with good governance, keep the edges porous right. between public and, and commercial, so you get the traffic between the two, you get good people spending one time in one sector, one time in another, exactly. and not, not feeling there's a terrible crunching of gears when they move from one to the other, because the fundamental sense of energy and purpose and innovation uh, is there. Uh, partnerships in a more formal sense, I mean, I was just thinking as you're talking here at the British Library, we work with, with well, public institutions, public partners. Uh, we have, there is an art to partnership which is partly psychological and institutional about daring to lower your barrier because you're always, you're always gonna have cultural difference, whatever else you do. We have a culture here, and it, you, know, you need to kind of dare to encounter others. So to be honest, whether it's commercial, commercial, public, public, or yeah. flavor of the two, you'll always have that. We're just doing a lot of work with a, in a new way with the public library sector, which you might imagine was very close to the British Library, but actually we've not been that close for some years, and we've had to, uh, on both sides, learn to work together. We do work um, very directly with commercial partners. The Google Books project continues, and we do work with Google Books. We mm -hmm. work with a, 
British digital company called Find My Past on digitization of newspapers, and there are trade-offs involved in that, but it's a, a very dynamic partnership uh, that is gradually getting more and more of the library's historic newspapers digitized, mm -hmm. which is something we couldn't have done solo. We literally don't have a public budget to do that. Uh, and that was a public value calculation. Uh, and I guess the art of judging, as with any joint venture, and I did some joint venture stuff at the BBC, is making sure that even though you've got two organisations uh, that have some varying objectives, that there is a sweet spot, there is an overlap of the Venn diagrams, yeah. where for that particular thing you can actually say they're headed in the same direction. And that means on the public side, mm -hmm. being pretty clear about what your public purpose is. Because right. if you end up doing a joint venture that may be making you money but isn't actually consistent with your public purpose, then that's yeah. when things go wrong. You end up damaging the brand or whatever it may yeah. be. Yeah, and that's fascinating because I think that's what's gone wrong in health, that there was nothing wrong with partnering potentially with some of the private actors. But when you have PFI schemes where the P, the first P of the PPPs, public-private partnerships, loses control of the kind of direction, what kind of health care system do we want? And at best, it's seen as just de-risking the private finance, that's when you know things can potentially go wrong. Mm. And it's quite interesting, actually, because one of the next talks, the next talk that we have, will be between Mike Bracken and Reiner Cattell, who's also sitting here. He's the deputy director of IAPP. And the reason we brought Mike into the Institute was his experience in GDS, actually setting up the government digital service, which founded then what is today gov.uk. And there's two interesting things there that relate to this conversation. First, that this, the skills, the capacity, the vision within GDS to set up what later became an award-winning website, gov.uk, actually came from the iPlayer team in so, BBC. Yeah, so, so what initially government did was it thought, oh, we're kind of stupid, right? We're just a bunch of bureaucrats. We should outsource the website. We don't have that knowledge. And they outsourced it to, surprise, surprise, Circo, which then didn't do a very good job. So people in the iPlayer team kind of moved over <laughs> uh, to GDS and produced this website, gov.uk. But with this leadership, um, between Mike Bracken and his colleagues that very quickly said, you know, we are producing a government digital platform that is funded publicly and it's for the public, so we have to think about users, sorry, citizens, as users. We don't think of them as clients. We don't think of them as customers, right? Think of them as users. So that's also where some of these public purpose, public value issues come in. And so I would kind of provocatively, even though I don't like the kind of you know, public versus private issue. But when you're partnering, so this is a question, with an organization potentially like GDS, which is producing a government digital platform driven by these kind of strong you know, thinking, for example, you know, citizens are users, not clients. In your experience, does that differ then from when you might, in, the, you know, in other types of collaborations, be working with a private digital producer, which as ambitious and interesting and creative as it might be, like Google, might not have some strong um, kind of public value kind of metrics and including what made people want to go work in Google might have not been um, you know, uh, areas around um, wanting to work for the public good and public value. So is it actually neutral? Does it, is it just about individuals and working with an interesting company? Or is it that sometimes actually there is some benefit to, for example, the British Library working with GDS as opposed to Google, yeah. also working with Google and other things, but what is the what do you think the criteria would be, or is it kind of just random? It depends what you're doing. Yeah, I think it's not random, uh, and it's not just whether people happen to get on. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think, again, I suppose without being, you can't be too scientific about it, but my judgment would be if I looked around our suite of partners at any given time, here, for instance, the library, <coughs> I'd probably want to reassure myself there's a reasonably healthy mix of public... Yeah private, charitable, commercial, and so on. Partly, you know, we're a very universal institution. We, it keeps us alert and honest in a way to engage in, in different ways and to seek where we can, uh, where we can uh, yeah, align interests, align, uh, align purpose. And I think uh, uh, clearly with GDS, or not like GDS, mm -hmm. we, we, uh, or let's just say with a public partner, mm -hmm you probably don't have to negotiate too long and hard about overall right. public purpose. Yeah. 
But you might need to negotiate about other things, and there's still governance and things to be talked about. What was that public money voted to do this rather than that? Because mm -hmm. you could track it back to, to source and think. So uh, it, sometimes you can have uh, it, it, public to public can be sometimes more cumbersome than you might think, and you need to be able to demonstrate this is making public value happen that couldn't otherwise happen, which is true. And that's yeah. what I think we're doing with yeah. many of our public partnerships. Uh, and with commercial, uh, I think honesty is the, the, the main thing. You know, you can't, uh, a com and, and commercial companies vary greatly. Some, uh, I think particularly newer generation ones, might be much closer to social enterprises and they might want to talk very openly about the public purpose component of what they do. They might want to not want to take always them, if they don't have shareholders in particular, they may not want to maximise profit. And there you can have a really interesting and fertile conversation. But even with, uh, and sometimes especially with, overtly and completely commercial companies, it can be a very pleasing uh, alignment. I think when we set up the BBC's yeah. commercial channels as a joint venture in the 1980s, we could be so crisp and clear about what we were each trying to do. There was no disguise. And we found this sweet spot where it was in, in mutual interest to do it. At that point, values become very right. important. Uh, you, you, you've got to have you, you have a, you need a very high degree of trust there. You need a very good contract, but also a, you need to be able to look partners in the eye and say, even though your very explicit motive is to build shareholder value and achieve this exit strategy or whatever it is then, nonetheless, uh, um, you have to believe uh, in, in this certain kind of clear values as well as purposes. So, and, and that's true of uh, a lot of the work we've done here. Right. And how about risk taking? So, you know, <laughs> the, the possibility that you might actually mess up a bit along the way. Do you think it's harder today in a public institution than a private one? I've always been struck by. I think you should take a look because I've heard you yeah. reflect okay. an observation on this, Mary. Yeah, I mean, I, so what I was struck even just last week, which is, you know, that when Zuckerberg was on trial, or not on trial, <laughs> giving evidence, sorry. I, think, I, I, I wish he was on I think trial. You're ahead, sorry. <laughs> Next thing I'll say is when Trump was impeached. No, but when he was there in front of the Senate committee, um, he almost, I don't want to say bragged, but you know, yeah, we made a mistake. We won't do it next time, right? And okay, people kind of accept that. And venture capitalists, I'm always struck by how almost proud they are of the kind of risk taking and for every success they have, they might actually have quite a few failures along the way. But actually to be delving into the spaces that you're talking about, you know, the kind of ambitions that you have today in the British Library and have had and the, you know, again, the learning program of the BBC, the micro might have gone wrong and it probably did go wrong along the way and then they came out with something great and actually we don't have it today in most of our offices. So is that a failure or not? Um, and so both this issue of how do you welcome the kind of exploration and trial and error and error and error process that we might have. We all know that in order to ride a bike, you might have to fall off. But when you're a public entity and you make a mistake, the risk is that you're in the you know, front page of the newspaper. Whereas again, in the private sector, it's almost seen as, you know, yeah, of course we take risks and we make mistakes, but look at that great success, right? So this whole issue of portfolios and investments in different areas does actually require one to accept that kind of failure process. So I guess I have two reflections. One is, um, do we actually today have less of an appetite within public institutions to make some errors? And does that actually affect how we set these big missions, like the learning program for the BBC? Is, would the BBC today also be as not just willing, but would it be allowed? Would it be able to have that remit of something as ambitious and kind of also fuzzy as what they were trying to do with that? But also, what kind of metrics then would we have to capture the so-called value for money in that case? So again, coming back to the micro, the fact that people don't have it, is that a problem? Or was it all the spillovers along the way, the fact that kids actually did learn how to code um, enough? And you, you see this with other much more kind of in some ways static and boring examples. So the, you know, the Concord plane, right? It's the classic case of the picking winners problem where governments were told, you know, don't bother actually trying to make a plane. All you should do is facilitate, um, you know, the uh, entrepreneurs and the businesses to actually make stuff. What you should do is, you know, invest in the infrastructure, the skills, but don't actually decide to make something and produce it because look what's going to happen. You're going to create a plane that's not flying. 
and yet the Concord, which is seen as emblematic of that problem, you know, the picking winners problem, it's true, it's not flying, and that would surely be a commercial failure <laughs> if it's not flying, but is it a public failure? And I've been struck by, basically, there's no study, and I've looked everywhere, I've got my students to look, that has actually tried to measure that. You know, in investing, in trying to get the Concorde actually to be eventually a commercial success, were there actually a whole set of spillovers across different parts of the economy, across different sectors, across the skill base, that actually made it worth it anyway, right? Even though the plane's not flying. And that requires one to really replace the kind of cost-benefit analysis, the net present value calculations that we have in the Treasury's Green Book with something actually that is able to capture these dynamic spillovers across a space, across an economy, ac across different ways it affects different parts of the population, and that's important for public institutions. And so, um, again, what does that look like? Uh, what does dynamic spillovers look like in the case of the British Library? And do you actually engage with that explicitly, you know, do you actually have metrics? Because some of my friends say, stop talking about metrics. We shouldn't even have to talk about public value in that kind of, you know, um, 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 kind of quantitative way. Can't we just tell stories, for example, about, you know, through case studies of great ways in which a particular investment then had an impact, for example, across a community. And yet then the Treasury, will they be interested in stories, right? You know, will they actually require some numbers? So again, you know, the value for money, yeah. but also the degree to which you can, even in cases where there were a bit of messing up in trial and error and error along the way, still be able to show that there was this, you know, yeah. valuable experience. And how, you know, should we give up quantifying it? Should it actually be enough to have some great case studies? Um, like in the case, surely, of the British Library and the BBC in particular domains, and should we actually learn to tell those stories and to capture them in, you know, contained ways? We can't write war and peace for each of these stories, but, or would you still believe in quantitative metrics as well? Wow, there's a lot there. Uh, Sorry, no, I, right. I, I tend let, to do that. Let, me take, it like... in <laughs> let me take it in reverse <laughs> order, Marianne. I, I yeah. think on measurements, even when we started talking to the BBC about public value, we knew in, in that instance, as we began to use that phrase, uh, within halfway through the sentence, you then start to ask, well, how do you measure it and what kind of me measurements and metrics are there? And I think uh, this, is, this is the task of, uh, of, of, the, of the work that y you and others are doing, I think, is to make that more mature, that debate. Uh, my, my, my rough practitioner's judgment is that Again, it's a, you, you, a healthy set of measures probably is blended. Yeah. That if you have nothing quantifiable to assert any kind of public value, then you lose trust. Yeah. But if you reduce it just to a set of numbers, you probably lost the heart and soul of what it is you're trying to do. So you need other kinds of evidence. Uh, narrative can be part of that, but essentially it's, it's descriptive um, evidence. And then you probably also need some level of holistic, delegated, just judgment to try and make sense of it because a, a pocket calculator isn't going to do it for you. You need the kind of algorithms in there to make those judgments of whether or not in, it's been a good year. We, we're coming to the end of our year where we're trying to assess, you know, has this been a good year? We think yeah. it has, but you need to accumulate that, uh, accumulate that story. Um, risk is very, I was listening to you, and this is why I'm going to have to think aloud, I think, because um, I haven't sort of explored that line of thought exactly as you put it out, except to say that I certainly recognise when you've spoken before about the, the almost uh, rabbit in the headlights fear it is possible to have if you work in the public sector about certain kinds of, of risk. Um, I mean, first of all, I think there, there are, in fact, in well, the broadcasting sector, the cultural sector, there is, in fact, plenty of common understanding about why it is a publicly funded entity, which in some respects is, is absolutely expected and empowered to take the biggest risks. Uh, I mean, a, that's partly what the research budget uh, of the nation is, is all about. Um, you, know, you, you, you would expect to be investing in failure after failure in order to get the one great insight or invention. Um, but in creativity, uh, you know, even the BBC, you know, the BBC has a pretty good reputation. Channel Four, where I'm yeah. on the board at the moment, yeah. absolutely, its schedule exists entirely to where it can push things a bit further, take risks, and take risks which 
because of course in the creative side the market can have its own conservatism and sometimes a greater mm -hmm. conservatism. Um, so I think we, we should look at actual habits and expectations before we, we, we make it binary. However, <laughs> the Green Book case, mm -hmm. the managing public money principles, the very, an important part of my role, very good disciplines of governance we have, which ultimately to ensure, it's not so much that public money isn't wasted, it's public money isn't, isn't just poorly or lazily used, you know, there's not that much of it and you've got to be, mm -hmm. be, be careful with it. So I guess our interpretation, and I think many of the, uh, I hope, sort of peers in the sector, is that you imbibe all of that because if you abandon it in the wrong way, you, you, you end up uh, with other bad outcomes and other bad effects. But you do take a risk, a more sophisticated risk-based views, and you try and articulate the other risks, the ones that people don't always articulate. The risk of doing too little. Right. The risk of doing things that are too uninteresting. <laughs> the risk of failing to meet people's expectation, almost yeah. limitless expectations about how cool your institution should be. Uh, because those are the things that end up killing an institution, yeah. is if you, and if you can quantify that, then it actually makes it easier to, to look at that and its corollary risk that yeah. some money might be wasted. And, and you can then take a judgment. They're very difficult, but you said at the beginning, yeah. this was not meant to be easy. Yes. Uh, but I think that might be one way to do it. And I mean, I think I would happily look Treasury in the eye and say, yeah. I'm happy to take carefully considered risks um, uh, if they are a balance of risk about doing too little rather than uh, doing too yeah. much. So in the Institute, we have actually a network we've set up called the Mission Oriented Innovation Network, where we're trying to get uh, global organizations, whether they be, again, the kind of public banks, innovation agencies, the strategic city kind of uh, um, agencies to talk to each other, to actually learn from the different experiences they've had around both the evaluation issues, but also on what it meant actually to take the risks. You know, how did you actually then justify that you know, big kind of mistake you made before you got to your success? And actually talking to someone called Cheryl Martin, she was the second director of ARPA-E, which is a very ambitious innovation agency in the US Department of Energy, uh, which was set up as a sister organization to DARPA, which of course is very famous for having been the key financier of what later became the internet. She actually said to us um, in, a, in an early conference, actually some years back before the institute was formed, and now we've brought in the organization to share their experience more systematically, that actually these two things are related. They actually evaluate themselves um, based on how many risks they were willing to take. So they don't think they're actually doing their job if they don't take the risks. But, big but, also how much impact their successes have, right? So if their successes then, after having made a bit of mistakes along the way, are kind of small, and they're just a bit of you know, a gadget here and there, versus one of their biz biggest successes has been uh, the biggest innovation so far worldwide around battery storage, which of course has a massive effect across many different sectors. Um, then they think they're failing, right? So both if they're not taking enough risks, but also if their successes don't have enough impact across the whole economy. And that, you know, it's, it's a really complex and difficult sort of set of issues to tease out. And what that actually means in a sort of public arts kind of area, health, education. And, um, and I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, especially because I think there's a feedback loop that when you say that that's your mission, actually to take those risks, but actually have impact, across the economy, it affects who you're able to hire. There's a self-fulfilling prophecy that the more you talk about your organization as at best fixing a market failure, at best facilitating the risk takers or de-risking the risk takers, at best leveling the playing field and then get out of the way, that that's gonna influence who is attracted to work in your organization. And so, you know, there's also a feedback, and, and, and one of the interesting things around organizations like DARPA, I would argue that it's precisely because they were mission-oriented that they were able to attract these, you know, very high-level scientists who were willing to leave Stanford and go be a civil servant. And this is, in fact, the experience that I learned also from Mike Bracken in leading GDS, that because they were actually very ambitious around what the organization was trying to do, it became very hard for the, the people working in uh, Tech City, or otherwise known as Silicon Roundabout, to um, the organizations there to hire some of the best computer engineers because they actually wanted to work in GDS. You know, that was the honorable, interesting, cool place to go. 
And so the last question before I want to open up to the audience is, do you think there's a certain type of either personality or skill set capabilities or also training programs that you need within an organization to get um, people working in a public organization to actually welcome that experimentation process? So especially around what you can do to train people to actually kind of relax a bit and, and welcome being explorative. Well, I, I think it, it, I'd probably bring it back full circle well, even to the point you've just been making around mission, mm -hmm. uh, the power of mission, uh, inspirational power of public purpose, and, and, a, and a version of that where the sky is actually the limit, if you right. get it right. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, if you're sincere about that, and that really is the kind of organization that, that you're creating, um, uh, the right people should begin to come. Uh, yeah. and, and that is, in the end, what the, the BBC, the British Library, these are, I hope, interesting places to work. And there's no, uh, uh, you know, we set out a prospectus in, in the living knowledge thing, which is very, very purpose-driven. Mm. But the purposes are pretty big. Uh, and you will read them and you think, well, if we are going to try and bring this collection to everyone, mm. and there's, we set no limit to it almost, uh, and we seek a great deal of partnership and innovation to get there, then I would hope the, the smart young people who will make their trade off. They may earn more yeah. up the road doing mm -hmm. other things, but at least for a while in their career, they would feel uh, this will galvanize me, this will bring the best out of me. Uh, maybe they'll feel it's worthwhile too. And again, we shouldn't underestimate that. As I say, I think there is a slight shift even in um, my son's generation as they begin to build businesses. Mm -hmm. that, that sense planetary challenges are so huge that to to make a business that doesn't make some attempt to make the world better, it's probably a mistake. Right. So I think, that, again, there's a common, there can be more common interests between the so-called public sphere and the so-called commercial one. So I, I, I think the responsibility sits at very, very top level in the culture of, of, of organizations. And I think um, uh, whether it's civil service, university sector, uh, 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 health sector, and so on. Um, but yes, uh, on the ground, you've got to live up to that and you've got to give people the tools and the confidence. And that needs to play right down to how you manage someone's appraisal at year end and so that that, that climate of fear that you've described yeah. that, that can shut down innovation yeah. doesn't accident, isn't does sort of, you can have sweet talk at the very top of the organisation, but it's, uh, uh, and that, as I articulate that, I'm very conscious responsibility here that I'm sure we don't get that right in this organization, the BBC doesn't get it right. Uh, but that will be, the, that will be the, the thread that I'd see. OK, great. Thanks. Yeah. So we want to open it up. We have uh, 30 minutes um, before we can all go Thanks, have a drink uh, at the bar. I'm a member of the public, and I may be the only member <coughs> of the public here, because I think we're all members of the Institute or of UCL. And I would like to ask you all to No, that's not true, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a good question. We're going to take two or three questions at a time. So that's a good first question. You can have a seat. We'll take two more questions. No, I will answer it. I'll happily yeah. answer it. It's a very yes. good question because, in fact, that's, as you say, the first bullet point. We'll get to it. Next, two questions, and then we'll take them in a group. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, the, the one. Hello, um, I'm Charles Rose. I'm a PhD student at King's College. Um, the the one thing that comes through from the conversation that you've had is the absolute necessity for clarity of purpose, both in terms of uh, inside of organisations and outside of organisations, and also in terms of the relationship between the public and the private sector, the necessity for the procurement process uh -huh. to be also clear and also extremely well managed. Well, I, I would like <clears throat> I would like to raise a question as well. Um, I'm so I'm working on the philosophy of public value, and um, I would be interested to hear whether in the process of writing the charter for the BBC or in any other uh, part of that process, you uh, were thinking and engaging with uh, the works of philosophers or other thinkers. 
um, who thought about the public purpose or you know the, the directionality that the state or an economy could take in writing that. Very good. good. So these are three great three questions. Very good questions. We'll start Shall with. Shall I do the yes, British Library one? Maybe you yeah, take yeah. the lead on I'll take the second one. Yeah. And then um, we can yeah. do it. And I'm happy yeah, yeah. to obviously yeah. talk with, have a go at the philosophy, but you might need to help me out on that. <laughs> um, Br British Library um, uh, is uh, we have an absolute principle that access to the collections of the British Library here on site and in the north at Boston Spa is free. Uh, and anyone, and in fact, we, my predecessor very boldly and rightly made it open. In the, in the past, you had to have university accreditation or academic support to be able to do that. Uh, as it was very controversial, but about 12 years ago, the rule was changed that anyone over the age of 18 had as a citizen's right, um, provided they could prove ID and so on, uh, the ability to gain a reader pass uh, and enter and use the reading rooms and have the full service of the BL. And it's not written into our Act of Parliament, it's pretty sacrosanct for me. Uh, and it's the absolute basis on which uh, we run the, the whole organisation. Um, so I think we, we, have, uh, we have a cafe, we have shops, with some of the special events and talks uh, we would charge for if we do a late event. We have a, we've always had a friends scheme and that's now become a members scheme. Uh, so like any museum or gallery, uh, those able and willing to pay an 80 pound fee can have a, access to a members room uh, and get some, uh, on the ancillary activities, get mm -hmm. some early discounts. But we've never allowed that to tip over into our mm -hmm. core purpose mm -hmm. because we believe in free access to knowledge within a library building. I'm sorry. Well, the friends was a paying scheme as well. So. Uh, oh, I see. Okay, so well, it's a debate over the. Uh, how how is uh, the, the how is the members not democratic? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure. It's not a standalone insti right. institution yeah. like the friends. Uh, but that would be a, if I may, that's, a, that's, yeah, a that's a slightly a, different yeah. and. Uh, a, technical discussion about the nature of a philanthropic friends scheme mm -hmm. but it's but it is important in a, in a forum like this or any forum to keep asserting the sanctity of access to knowledge in libraries it's the basis of all libraries the length and breadth of the country so I think mm -hmm. uh, uh, happy to chat afterwards uh, and if you were a friend uh, mm -hmm. and if that's a change uh, then we can definitely talk about that scheme Good. and this series we thought Precisely for the reasons you're saying, yes, which yeah, I'd agree with, it has to be free. We, we fought it. <laughs> no, we yeah. didn't fit it. It was very important for this series on public value to be open to the public, even though in the evening, obviously, it costs more. It was very important for anyone to be able to come to this series. Yeah. So, you know, the public is welcome here. You just walk in and come. Um, so the issue of procurement is extremely important because actually, A, it hasn't actually in this country really been linked up necessarily in an ambitious way with programs of different types of public purpose. Um, so even health, you know, an area like health, um, to be able really to procure in um, health would be able, we would be able to better link up the innovation system, right? So, you know, we have across the um, street here, um, Crick, is that what it's called? And we have the Wellcome Trust and we have different types of um, you know, third sector organizations working around sort of the life sciences area around innovation, but the degree to which the NHS itself has been able to link in and work dynamically with how we think about health innovation, I think has been, that opportunity has been missed by the fact that procurement policy itself hasn't been used in the way that actually is used, frankly, in the military. Hmm. And we don't like to talk about the military because that's about war and bombs, but actually the military is interesting because on the one hand, you know, many of the technologies in our smart products actually came about through the spillovers that came about through mission-oriented problems, right? It was actually the, the space race and the Sputnik that actually got us to think about, you know, going to the moon and back again in a generation. And even had we not gotten to the moon, many of the spillovers from that experience would have probably produced some of the technologies that we have today. But the use of procurement to actually buy in and to use government's purchasing power to not just you know, provide the spillovers, but also to dictate what the criteria 
will be, what it is you actually want, what kind of, um, whether it's health or energy, or in the case of public broadcasting, the characteristics, but then to use instruments carefully crafted to allow lots of bottom-up experimentation, right? So on the, one, on the one hand, you have this issue of directions. You're trying to procure in a certain type of thing, but the way you do it is left open, allows us to get this greater balance between top-down and bottom-up, which is something that continues to be a tension in different spaces. But I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if this is what you're talking well, about. Really, oh, sorry. Has gone into some of the, 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 the problems that was in the talk in the, in the exchange, which is that it, it goes out from the specific to the quite woolly mm. very quickly, and that in 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 a sense uh, you're talking about spin-offs, uh, th this uh, spillovers, whereas in actual fact there's an awful lot that could be gained from just going for value, and making mm. sure that what was what money was spent was spent well and that it was very clear what it was actually being, sp being spent to create. Shall I, I mean, yeah. just uh, uh, pick up on that, because I think it, 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 it's an absolutely correct point, because we do a lot of procurement here, of course, and, it, and it's, uh, it is, uh, it's an art as well as a science, good, good procurement, both the how you set the procurement in the first place, the quality of the process you run, the transparency of it, and so on. And uh, in a way, I think your question exposes extremely practically one dimension of, 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 of what we're worrying away at here. Uh, because I think when you say choose the best value uh, one, and usually there is a basket of scores you're working on, but, but often what that means is the one which is simply appears to do the job mm -hmm. for the least amount of, of money. And in, in, in an awful lot of cases, I, mean, I don't know, 80, 90 percent of cases, that is a pretty easy judgment to make, and that, that, is, that is the winning bid. But, and it's got to be transparent, uh, it, 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 there is, there is a, a craft to creating a balance of measures, it's a bit like the measurement mm -hmm. of public value, at point of procurement, where we are saying, look, we're looking for a, a, a supplier that can demonstrate credibility in this particular dimension or, or has a particular kind of commitment to certain kinds of outcome. I don't know, I'm inventing this, which you could put waiting on, and, and it does sometimes happen, provided you can justify it. You can, of course, as you know, choose a, an outcome which is not the cheapest because you may not, in the end, trust the cheapest to be the best, but the best has to tie back to public purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, as I say, it's not defensible. Does that get closer? So I'm trying to be practical about it. You're absolutely right. Yes, and I, and I, 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 I won't hang on to this. But, <laughs> okay. but the, the, uh, my own experience, because I've sold to government and um, yeah. I, I developed the, the technology and the TURT service for tagging criminals in the UK. Mm. Uh, and that was a, a most interesting set of experiences. <laughs> but uh, but what, what, what I, I learned was that in different locations, uh, the, the difference between Scotland and England was very different. The, mm. the, quali the qualitative aspects were very different. Uh, and this point which you just made, which I think is the excellent one, which is that actually the lowest price is not always the best price. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That, well, that, well, that, yes. That's really, yeah. really interesting. Um, and I think the lesson held in that probably actually ramifies out to, to some of the, the arguments you're making. Um, I think the third question was about philosophers. And I'm afraid <laughs> it, it was only in one of our previous conversations that uh, even though I was meant to have read some of this stuff at university that I realised Aristotle yeah. uh, used yeah. a version of the phrase public value, which I still haven't got back and, and checked and exactly which term in Greek it was. So, uh, no, I think at the time we did consult some of the contemporary uh, literature, which we probably weren't doing our research. Well, it wasn't that rich what we, okay. could, uh, what we could discover, and the term was being used in very... Very, for obvious reasons, very, very diverse, uh, diverse ways. Um, uh, but I don't think it's, I think it's the right question, because this is one of the moments when the world does need a bit of philosophy, because you've got, if, you, if, you, if, if we want to actually change policy in the public discourse, we need a bit of good theory to underpin yeah. it. But you may know Well, I mean, actually, perhaps you should also tell us more about your work, but one of the things I've learned both from Lucas and others is that both in philosophy, as a discipline, and in economics, there's been almost a retreat uh, from the questions of what should be done, what should actually, coming to, back to your question, what should we produce? 
Um, this idea that actually we just need to think about these more kind of horizontal issues, especially within economic thinking, that the public shouldn't actually decide what's to produce, you know, what to produce, that's the so-called market. Businesses need to do that, and we're just facilitating, creating the background framework conditions. You taught me that there's also a parallel retreat from the normative of what should be done <laughs> um, in philosophy. Hmm. And, um, and this, it's interesting sort of which led which, or if there's been a sort of a co-evolution of that problem. But this is one of the issues that, you know, what kind of health service, what are the criteria of the, of the um, health uh, service that we should use to decide whether we've achieved that, right? Um, and the issue with the spillovers, by the way, is simply that by using these kind of narrow cost benefit net present value calculations in the green book that we were talking about before, it actually does make you go down to sort of the idea that somehow you're just going to choose the best, you know, sorry, the lowest cost kind of solution. Whereas if you start focusing on these more qualitative issues of, well, you know, the health service that we're trying to create needs to actually satisfy these four or five different dimensions, that creates a much more um, complex but potentially interesting uh, metric. I don't know if, Lucas, you want to give us the answer. Who is the philosopher we should be <laughs> yeah. reading? Who do we got to read? Yeah, that yeah. would make life much easier. Yeah. So, so um, do, do you want yeah, you can, to yeah. just briefly. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned Aristotle, and I think uh, one really good thing in Aristotle is that he, um, you know, he says the, the a state is a community which aims at the highest good. <laughs> and I think you, that the one job of philosophy is to spell out what is this notion of the highest good. Yeah. And, and I think one, one very good way of doing that is to think of a utopia. What would be an ideal society? Um, and then we can think about how can certain institutions like the British Library or other actors help us get towards that utopia. And then we can think about whether it's actually a utopia, whether you know, it's impossible to reach or whether it's actually possible. Because many times in the past we realized that certain things were possible that you know, we thought are impossible. Wow. Can I just come back on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and just Briefly, because I think it's, uh, um, yes, without becoming totally utopian and trying to design a perfect state, you certainly, in great mission driven and purpose driven organizations, there is uh, there's always a sense of something better just out of reach and that you, mm -hmm. can, you, you can go further, or, or, or a more uh, ideal, I never use the phrase end state, but a more ideal state you could be in. And I guess it's just a reflection as much as anything else, uh, which feels very urgent now. I think because the pace of technology has accelerated so greatly, uh, even in the last decade, it feels like we are swimming in multiple parallel, very fast moving innovations. We have the Alan Turing Institute here, you know, trying to think their way through big data and machine learning and AI. Uh, we've seen massive interventions in um, social profiling, uh, big data, bio biological data. And, and I think we are lacking, maybe it is philosophers, maybe it's some combination of philosophy and economics, that, that actually allows at policy level uh, some good end states to be configured so that we can actually start directing people in those directions. Otherwise, it's going to head off in the direction of just of, of the most powerful interest in the room. At any, there's no time to stop and think. So, three more questions. I have one here, Jake, in there. Yeah. And then we'll take another round. Yes, sorry. Um, so I'd just like to, oh, sorry, there's two. Sorry. <laughs> yes, for the video. <laughs> um, I would just like to pick up on this with the question of public purpose and have we lost the battle in, in some of the fields and how can we regain or how can we shift mm. the balance back? So two examples maybe just briefly, one in education, you know, where our institutions are now so commercialized with students not being even users, you know, they're yeah. very typically customers. Yeah. Students come out of education with tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds of debt and um, the whole way that education is shifting. I think it's quite alarming. So how can we, you know, what, what should we be doing to, you know, gain that battle back for the public purpose of education? Mm -hmm. And the second example possibly um, on Facebook, because the whole debate around Cambridge Analytica and the kind of what Facebook is doing is turning us into the product yeah. because we're giving away our data. Now, my data just by myself may not be that valuable. 
And that's a classic example of where not my data, but the data of all of us then becomes valuable. And that's a truly public value and good. But how could we, you know, step, you know, gain the battle back and, and get some battleground against these big corporates? Because if I leave Facebook, no one cares. Right? So how can we, yeah. as, a, as a society, you know, kind of define the kind of conversations and social media that we want to have, not being dictated by what is available commercially? Okay. Um, yeah. And then Jake. Yeah, so I actually also have two questions. <laughs> Sorry. So the first one kind of starts from this concept of risk that we were talking about. So I was wondering how new technologies that are being implemented, so as you were mentioning, for example, blockchain and AI, and the fact that public institutions are anyway starting to take on board them. So for example, Estonia with blockchain is the first thing that comes to my mind. Do you think that this is going to change the concept of risk that these organizations have and kind of help on um, the cultural change happening within those organizations to become to make them more risk-taking or otherwise kind of exacerbate or exaggerate the crowd-in, crowd-out debate. Mm -hmm. And the second one is about the concept of public purpose and public value because as we are starting on the kind of considering as a baseline that this value needs to be considered more widely, so not only a cost-effective analysis or MPV, MVP analysis. So when you're actually configuring a mission, especially for your organization, how do you then face the trade-offs that the different type of value might have, you're looking for can, can generate? Because if you're pursuing a really general mission that you might have trade-offs within the investments and initiatives, so is that challenging and how do you, would you start overcome it? Yeah. Okay, Jake? Thanks a lot. Um, it's Jake Sumner, and I'm a, a fellow at uh, Institute of Public Purpose, and also I was a Camden councillor here, um, in where, we, where we are. And it was really to, to Rowley. Um, we're in this building. It's great. And you talked out about some of the purpose of this. And this is actually a question not about the BBC, but about, about where we are. Um, but when this was built, it's, quite, it's not facing out to the community uh, the, uh, that it sits in, which is Summers Town, which is one of the poorest parts of Camden. And I think, I suppose, it, there's a missed opportunity um, in how it looks outwards and how it engages. Now, obviously, it's a national institution, you know, global reputation, all the rest of it, but it is located in a community. And I suppose, does that then speak to the, uh, the type of value it's, it's sending out, or what it speaks to? and lessons elsewhere in the future. And, and one of the reasons I, I say this is because I was very struck by speaking with Ted Howard, who runs the Cleveland Project. And Cleveland was one of the richest cities, it's now one of the poorest. It had, some, it had an institution, it had three big institutions there. None of the public procurement spend was spent locally. And then through the Charity Foundation, sort of worked with him and his organization to work with three big institutions, one of them one of the best hospitals in the world. Um, to then start doing local procurement, which employed people, et cetera, and creating much greater public value locally and jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so that's the point, is that there is also a, a purpose in the connections to the localities in which public institutions operate, and how do you see that, particularly vis-a-vis yeah. -vis your building? Which, what? do you want to take the last I'd one begin first? with the last one? Just yeah, why don't we begin with that? Fresh, yeah. fresh in the mind. Um, Really good and important question. Uh, and I think this is a wonderful building, but it was built as a fortress, uh, and it did turn its back on, uh, on, on Summers Town. Um, and um, we, we're really working at it. In fact, Robbie's here, oversees our community engagement team, and we're doing more every Thursday afternoon. Hopefully, you'll see our kind of pop up in Summers Town now. And we've, uh, uh, I mean, it is uh, um, tomorrow morning, I'm going to. Uh, health permitting speak at a, a primary careers conference which is actually part of the knowledge quarter partnership in the neighborhood where we and various institutions are trying to engage with nine-year-olds eight and nine-year-olds from primary schools around here which famously is the age before which people have decided that knowledge careers yeah. are not for them uh, and that's part of a general 
push which we are we're, we're trying to do to open the library up in the right way uh, and locality is vital to that the more digital and globally connected we get the more I think that the power of place and, and, and immediacy uh, grows we said with knowledge quarter it's roughly a mile circle from where we are it contains Google British Museum welcome all these mighty UCL mighty beasts mm -hmm. but it also contains two or three of the poorest parts of the whole city um, and, I, I, and it, interestingly we talked about the, the language of mission and purpose so the mission in here which we, we did debate in living knowledge has uh, we make our intellectual heritage accessible to everyone which and we, British Library has never had a mission with mm. that word in it before. Now we do, mm. and uh, it's unachievable. It's, it's utopian in the sense mm -hmm. that we were talking about just now, but it means it is inexcusable to say that there's anyone living in Somerstown who could not have a connection mm -hmm. with something that we look after here. So, and this is a multi-generational challenge. So. Uh, Sounding like we're doing very well. No, we're not. We're just scratching, scratching the surface, but we're certainly alive, um, very alive to it. Hmm. I'll take um, your question. I'm afraid we only have five more minutes, so I'm going to try to be brief. Do our best, yeah. um, there is this problem that when there is, you know, these challenges that we have around education or now with the issue around privacy, that it becomes almost like a divide and conquer kind of solution. And there is in that kind of collective bargaining. You know, we can actually learn from how trade unions fought in the past to get us things like weekends in the eight-hour workday, yeah. <laughs> which we wouldn't have, frankly, if people didn't die for it. And it wasn't every person fighting for their own amount of hours they wanted to work. There was collective bargaining, and people actually died in that battle to get us what we all take advantage of today. And, and this is important because one way to think about that Facebook kind of challenge around data privacy would be, in some ways, how I would initially at least think about it, which is, oh, but this was you know, collectively financed by the public sector, almost all the technology, in fact, that we use, that Facebook relies on, which is the internet, et cetera, and the data itself is publicly, you know, it's the citizens' data that we're talking about. So shouldn't the citizens get a share, right, simply? And in fact, there are some um, <laughs> Uh, uh, debates out there. We just actually hosted one in Parliament about this. That perhaps every time you click, you know, on um, on an advertisement and uh, or on something on Facebook or on some of these other um, softwares, and you you can actually find out how much money you are contributing to Google's or mm -hmm. Facebook's uh, budget, and then that goes back even to some sort of tax accounting scheme, and you get back a rebate given what you've actually produced. Anyway, there's different discussions, but that's not it, right? That's just getting a piece of the pie as opposed to rethinking what the pie should be and how to form it. And that does come back to, you know, down to this market creating, market shaping issue. And I think you know, it's, it's tough. But I mean, around, well, it's tough in the sense that, unfortunately, precisely thinking about the blockchain technology, which, by the way, one of the real forces about blockchain is that it potentially cuts out intermediaries, right? And so the value actually produced, if you can capture it and reinvest it back into something that we're interested in, which is proper public education and public health care, literally the pot of money is higher because there's less rent. Rent seen, I just gave a talk actually about this last night, rent seen it as not the rent that you're paying for accommodation, but rent seeing it as Adam Smith and David Ricardo and Karl Marx understood it as kind of these intermediaries that are sometimes they're just moving things around. Um, and getting quite a bit of money from it. When you take out that possible rent seeking and rents, there actually is more potential value, which on one hand we're talking about, but how to distribute that value, how to use that value to create the utopian kind of um, um, ambitions, I think, is, is the issue. And I think around you know, education, which I'm just struck by in this country, I've got four kids going to public uh, schools, is that this idea of choice, right, that you can either choose either to send your kids to public or to private, and I, being the citizen I am, send them all to public, or sorry, public meaning what the rest of the world means by public, which is state. That's already a complete deformation in this country that you know, we call private public. Oh, someone's trying to fool us. One of our more Orwellian phrases. That is crazy. Uh, anyway, whatever. Yeah, the UK, yeah. um, so I send my kids to state. But the, um, you know, the self-fulfilling prophecy, right, so that when you start to defund and not have, you know, uh, anyway, parents all sending their kids to the state system and fighting together, coming back to that kind of collective bargaining issue. But also what I find striking in this country is that the curriculum is actually different. 
right? So this idea, coming back to these underprivileged areas, that perhaps if you're not going to a particular type of private institution, you won't be able to really handle Greek and Latin and philosophy. And so that is only offered in certain kinds of schools and the state curriculum doesn't include that. I mean, that is incredibly problematic. I, I don't want to use the word fascist because I try not to use that because it's, it's misused, but actually, it is a bit fascist, isn't it? Certain people have the capacity, the capability, the brain structure, the DNA to handle these sort of difficult concepts. This, this is a very messy area that this country in particular, which has a very kind of public private educational system where an increasingly high number of people are still, or sorry, are even you know, in the middle classes or sending their kids to private has really um, created some problems in the educational structure in terms of these opportunities, the kind of concept of opportunities and capabilities that Amartya Sen talks about, which really have to be shared. It's not that you say, I'm going to give you these opportunities and capabilities to foster you know, certain kinds of uh, career structures and you different ones. That common set of opportunities that we think everyone should have and capabilities around them is damaged by having this sort of idea of choice in education as well as um, individual bargaining if we're thinking about our privacy. So. Um, I'm afraid we are I'm afraid. Yeah, over. <laughs> and anyway, so hopefully this has sort of teased out some of the um, issues that I think the rest of the series is going to look at. In fact, the next one, literally next week, with Reiner and Mike, I think you will be going into some of the issues, especially around blockchain, AI, and the future of data. And Reiner, who comes from Estonia, I think has a lot to say about it because Estonia is actually a poster child in terms of the digital agenda, and yet, has had rapidly rising inequality. And so how do we actually think of both you know, innovation-led growth and the power of technology to achieve incredibly interesting utopian ends, while at the same time having very concrete metrics, coming back to your question, um, about you know, what are we actually talking about? Did you achieve it or not? Around reducing inequality, not increasing it. It's, 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 it's a very interesting issue. And uh, Unfortunately, we continue to mythologize certain aspects of it and not uh, engage with the difficulties that we said in the beginning we should. Anyway, so thank you for coming. Thank you very um, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.